we may as well get started. And we'll start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the um, the lands of the Wajak Noir people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so the talk today, we have got two people presenting, but the, the paper itself is written by three different people. So two, two papers. So the first paper is hashtag single not sorry, analysing transnational post-feminist media cultures via Tinder marketing by Samuel Morris and Amy Shields Dobson. So um, I'll read out Samuel's bio. So Samuel completed a Master of Digital and Social Media at Curtin University's School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry in 2021. His thesis examines the way Tinder's technology and marketing shapes and contributes to our ideals of intimate relationships in the contemporary dating landscape. And Dr. Amy Shields Dobson is in the room with us today if we're not evacuating. <laughs> <laughs> is a lecturer in digital and social media at Curtin University whose research is concerned with gender politics, youth and social media. They have published widely on post-feminist media and digital cultures, sexting and contemporary feminine subjectivities. Amy leads the Digital Intimacies Research Program in CCAT and I'll hand over to Amy and you can introduce the next speaker after. Oh, okay, I'll introduce Kia after. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. So um, I would also like to acknowledge the custodians of the land on which we meet today and where I live. Um, this is Wajak Buja and sovereignty was not ceded. And so I want to pay my respects to custodians of this place, past, present and emerging, who are with us on campus in the physical and in the spiritual. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of Sam, and I'll put this on rather than use it as a microphone, um, today, who's taking a much needed break from academic life after finishing their masters. Um, and I'm not, so I'm presenting for us. But this was this is a paper that we've written together based on um, an extended sort of project after Sam's um, master's thesis. And yeah, I'll explain a bit more about that in a sec. So in short, Tinder has become dominant in the dating landscape for young adults in many locations around the world with 75 million active monthly users. And it's available in 190 countries and 40 languages. And um, yeah, as I said, the paper I'm presenting is, is by myself, by Sam and myself and Sam's master's project um, explored the role of Tinder in shaping prominent ideals of intimate relationships and part of that project involved a review of Tinder's prominent advertising campaigns. And that's the part that got me quite interested in looking at um, post-feminist discourses within Tinder marketing and, and analysing them from that perspective. So Sam applied for a Curtin Summer School scholarship to look into this further. and. Um, Together, we've done a kind of a semiotic analysis of t some of Tinder's recent advertising campaigns. So there's quite a bit of scholarship on dating apps and Tinder specifically that I won't go into today and particularly user motivations and then what more for our interests work on gendered and sexual scripts in relation to dating apps and Tinder specifically and intersectional user experiences on Tinder. And what this scholarship helps to shed light on is cultures around use and how user experiences are socially structured on Tinder. And we'd suggest that our analysis of Tinder marketing materials contributes to understanding gendered cultures of use and intersectional user experiences by illuminating the kind of gendered and racialized representations and the kind of cultures and subjects that are being hailed or called forth around Tinder use and the stories being told about Tinder use through their marketing material, through their ads. So to kind of give a real brief overview of some of the key ideas that we're drawing on here, um, post-feminist, accounts of post-feminist media cultures in the context of neoliberalism and globalisation 
help explain the kind of contemporary cultural dynamics that Tinder's product design and marketing clearly speaks to. Now, in really brief short, to really brief to kind of try and summarise some of the key ideas we're drawing from, Ros Gill in the mid-2000s outlined a kind of post-feminist sexual subjectification, right? So a shift from objectification to subjectification in media representations of women. Um, and this has been a key idea for understanding contemporary discourses of femininity and sexuality in particular in advertising. Um, and many, many, uh, many, many feminist media scholars have provided more examples since of the way that um, in media representations, women and advertising in particular, women's confidence is drawn on sexual freedom. That door is really, there we go. <laughs> women's confidence to go and shut the bloody door. Um, sexual freedom and free choice is depicted and valued in representations of women yet in a way that retains patriarchal status quo of women's bodies being available for a masculinised heteronormative gaze and, of course, very narrow, you know, representations when I say women's bodies there. Um, now, then, why is this not moving forward? Linda, can you come and help me how, how to um, control my slides? Oh, there we go. It's working. Yeah. Okay. So, young women are frequently positioned as up for it, desiring subjects. And then Jin Lee talks more about how this happens on Tinder specifically. So, and, and cultures of you. So, Lee suggests that on Tinder, a patriarchal idealisation of the cool girl has developed, whereby cool girls are those that accept casualised forms of misogyny that are bound in post-feminist dating cultures, and also those that kind of go along with the broader neoliberal cultural economic discourse of free market access to women's bodies. The cool girl figure in post-feminist popular culture, as Lee summarises, is celebrated for her confidence, rebellious spirit and sexual freedom whilst maintaining traditional feminine qualities. And then um, Jess Butler's sort of intersectional critique of post-feminist media scholarship in we're drawing from here, and who talks about in the in westernised cultural context that the the way racial and ethnic differences are commodified in post-feminist representations. So Butler argues that um, whilst post-feminist media still overtly or subtly privileges and centres a white middle-class heterosexual subject, this does not, quote, necessarily mean that non-white, non-middle-class and non-heterosexual women are altogether excluded from or somehow unaffected by post-feminist discourse. Butler's analysis of post-feminist representations charts some of the ways in which racial and ethnic differences are commodified in post-feminist media cultures, and she argues that often an increased representation of non-white female bodies in post-feminist media works to reinforce the logic that old-school feminist and racial politics are kind of no longer necessary. Uh, that they're somehow outdated. And Butler also neatly summarises the global dynamics involved in disarticulating feminism, which is an idea put forth by Angela McRobbie, whereby non-Western women in the global South are often discursively kind of positioned as sexually constrained and victimised in false contrast to supposedly sexually free young women in the West, thereby recreating and reinforcing notions of Western superiority, whilst also weakening potential alliances based on feminist post-colonialist critique. Um, so those are, in very brief, some of the ideas that we're trying to draw on in our analysis of uh, Tinder marketing. Because the Tinder brand and its success, we suggest, is firmly situated within these broader cultural discourses whereby feminism has been kind of disarticulated, particularly in the global north, and the need for feminism often displaced onto women in the global south. 
And as in short, Maria Lugones argues, neoliberal notions of modernity itself are very much structured around gendered and colonial constructs of sexual freedom and individualism. Um, and we think this shows up quite starkly uh, when we looked at the way Tinder is marketed across Europe and America as distinct from what we also, Sam also ended looking um, closely at the, the Tinder India YouTube site. So from 2018 to 2020, Tinder ran its first major branding campaign, um, Single Not Sorry. And this, it turns out, was delivered. Um, at first, we were sort of, Sam was looking around and, you know, there's all different, there's so many different media artifacts in this campaign. Uh, short videos, taglines, images on social media, digital displays and outdoor advertising. And of course, in the way that micro-targeted advertising works, very different and distinct little videos appearing in each, cult, in each different culture and location. But essentially, single not sorry was the kind of globalised or transnational campaign across Western Europe, Western regions of Europe and the US um, in late 2020. So Sam collected and analysed media artefacts from the US, UK, Germany, Sweden, France, Spain, Denmark and Italy. And through the numerous variations of this campaign across multiple languages and media, Clearly, young women are the main focus and target market, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, although some of the videos in this, in this campaign depict or gesture towards matching with young men or same-sex matches, which all fits into the kind of, uh, you know, woke urban lifestyle kind of being created here. Um, but the, the title itself is really key, right? So single, not sorry. So being single has historically been positioned as a social and cultural tension for women in particular, as Anthea Taylor's written extensively about. And so this campaign speaks to a set of gendered norms and sex role stereotypes. And the campaign aims to, or um, positions itself as sort of aiming to challenge the notion of singlehood as a purgatory-like temporal zone between the supposed stability of committed relationships. It provides an alternative cultural narrative to the perception that Tinder is a solution to the problem of singleness. It doesn't really want Tinder to be a solution to that problem. <laughs> it wants to be a lifestyle tool in an ongoing way for clear economic um, purposes. Um, so there's a kind of so the campaign slogans celebrate women dating the way they want to and emphasise the freedom available in eschewing long-term romantic relationships and normalising casual sex and sociality. And the campaign um, thus aligns the Tinder brand with some broad feminist ideals around um, and discourses of a certain kind in questioning ideals around coupledom as the desired norm and promoting platonic, temporary and non-exclusive forms of intimacy as equally, if not more valid, valuable and desirable as long-term committed romantic relationships for young women in particular. In brief, overall here, singlehood is framed as, as a position of self-determination for young women, uh, with commitment positioned as a limitation on one's ability to be spontaneous. And this is evident in the kind of appropriation we see here of the, uh, the, the celebration of breakups and the romance narrative. Cliche, happily ever after, has been turned into happily ever now. Uh, congrats on your big breakup. These are some ads from the American market of the young, empowered black women celebrating their breakups together. Uh, whereas here we see from across the, I think, different European campaigns, the slightly more innocent white woman stepping out the window um, after a casual fuck. Um, so, Sam also, as I said, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because there is so much in this page. <laughs> um, Sam also looked at the Tinder India site at the same time um, because it, it, you know, we were kind of curious to see uh, what 
is this the only campaign that's running globally or can we find other examples? And the Tinder YouTube in India came up as a prominent one with a lot of media artefacts in English, so sort of easily accessible for us to look at, that had, you know, Single Not Sorry was mentioned in, in a few of their media artefacts, and this isn't the only si but series of media artefacts, but it, there was no single campaign here in the way there was in Europe and the US. And quite prominently featured during the data period collection were a series of ex these explainer style pedagogical videos which draw on feminist discourses to unpack sex and gender stereotypes and address issues such as safety, consent, safe sex um, and women's safety while dating. Um, and the videos, this video series represents a partnership with an organisation um, in India called Vitamin Stree. So between Vitamin Stree and Tinder, and Vitamin Stree is, is quite an explicitly feminist oriented orientated content producer that focuses on providing sex and gender identity and sexuality information for a youth market in India. Um, and they have a whole bunch of really interesting and some really, you know, what looks to an outsider's perspective good content, but that's not the focus of the analysis here today. We're, we're interested in the partnership between Vitamin Street and Tinder. Um, and I won't say too much more about this, but to give you an idea of what happens in some of these videos. Um, so, Tinder is not explicitly mentioned or advertised in much of these, these pedagogical style sort of content um, info videos. Uh, rather, you know, they consist of a breakdown of critiques of gender and sexual stereotypes that impact women's sexual and social freedoms and then kind of come around in each video to strategically position social discovery apps as key tools for modern social life in India. So Tinder is never explicitly mentioned other than to refer to things like, other than to refer to research done by Tinder. <laughs> um, so for example, in the, you know, they've got one on single not sorry, which does much more explicitly unpack the gender stereotypes around what it means to be a single woman and the marriage market in India. And then they have, you know, how to have great sex and the rules of dating. And then not here for hookups, the tagline is, is about critiquing that phrase, not here for hookups, and expl explaining that casual sex is not a bad thing, that it doesn't need to be like taboo, um, that you can be here for hookups if you want to be. Um, and in, through a series of, you know, uh, the cutesy info video aesthetics kind of explain and break down a lot of gender stereotypes. And at one point in this video, quite show like a, um, a mini golf set with two holes, one labelled traditional outlook and the other labelled modern outlook. And then a golf ball sort of veers towards the traditional hole traditional outlook hole and then swerve, swerves and lands in the modern outlook hole um, to kind of as a rep, visual representation of the way that women in India are like changing the, the, um, the narrative and challenging gender stereotypes and, and wanting to engage in more modern uh, relationships. But the key thing is that social discovery apps are positioned as the as a key tool here and as very, you know, and as, as about very much safety and control is the emphasis in these, these different campaigns on the Tinder India YouTube site. Now, and we need to unpack this a bit more before I finish up, right? Um, and because trespassing into private property was one of the repeated motifs throughout the whole single not sorry campaign in videos, in posters, um, women trespassing onto private property or climbing over fences with their Tinder dates. And we're like, okay, what's this about? <laughs> like, so um, I love this image, right? Because what we can see here is the way in which gender, Signs of gender, signs of sexuality, signs of physical ability and signs of race are all key in working together here to position, to make us read this as what we call light rebelliousness and, you know, 
a fun scene rather than a criminalised scene, okay? And, we're, and that's why I love this image because it's, it's, you know, it's all of the, the, the intersectional identities kind of are really key here in, in, in helping us read this image that way, in the way that I think Tinder wants us to read this, which we call light rebelliousness and risk constructed through very, you know, racialized but also gender, sexual, and I'll talk more about that, so, okay, talk. Uh, so, this is a repeated theme of this women engaging in lightly rebellious activities with men via depictions of them trans transpassing private property, breaking into swimming pools at night time with male dates, uh, and the racialized dynamics of representation are particularly key within this motif, we suggest in the paper. So, this is a poster from the US market that depicts a very young, as Sam and pointed out, looking woman, like she could be 16, um, white woman climbing over a chain linked fence. There's a stormy grey afternoon sky behind her and the words single not sorry centred on the image. The woman is photographed from a low angle and so she's and wearing high top sneakers, very short ripped sh um, shorts and a midriff leather jacket which all work together to suggest youthfulness here. And then, of course, her long blonde hair is out. Her face is slightly flushed uh, with, with sweat and her head is held high as she scans the horizon. So that there's the signs of like youthfulness and um, whiteness. And then we see a pretty older looking man, right? <laughs> Quite significantly, am I wrong there? Older looking. But climbing, following her over the fence. Um, and the, the keep out sign is next to her leg, signaling that she's the one who's made it over onto this private property and that her male companion is following her lead, which is also quite key, isn't it? You wouldn't, they wouldn't have this image reversed with the guy leading the way over the fence on a Tinder date. Again, that would maybe be a little bit too risque or suggestive of like, risky, violent situations. Um, so we suggest that signs of whiteness for both bodies and youthfulness are key here for the girl in allowing this scene to be read, as I said, as innocent fun and not criminalised, you know? Like, imagine a black body in this scene. It would not be suggestive of the things that they're wanting it to be suggestive here. Um, or a more butch-looking body in this scene or an older woman in this scene much less, it would, they, these other bodies we suggest would signal towards much less culturally permissible and empowered forms of rebelliousness and risk that Tinder is kind of pushing at here. Now, a different example, in a similar vein but different, uh, quite a few of the videos depict um, young people jumping into pools fully clothed on dates, usually in, in scenes that suggest that the pool is a private one that's been broken into after hours. And I'll show you one example, again, in which racialized signifiers are quite key in constructing um, this scene. Did I open it? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the top. Okay. Uh, stop sharing yeah. and then which content share there. Okay. Thanks. That works. Okay. So this is, um, so in Europe and in France, this one's from France, which features, um, it, but in the single not sorry campaigns across Europe, there's little short videos of match with Luke, match with Andy, um, match with different people, and then like a video about, about that. So in France, there was match with Andy, match with Luke, match with Julie, and match with Kareem. So Kareem is the only non-Anglophone name in that list, and that's quite significant. Um, yeah.
I'll just show it again. We don't want that, no. <laughs> because it's quite quick. Okay. Uh, so via very quick cuts, two teenage men explore a building with torches in hand at night time, implying they're breaking into private property. And the focus is on Kareem, who has brown skin, is wearing a loose fitting, bright orange colored long sleeve top with a gold chain necklace around his neck. Uh, and looks quite unflinchingly at the camera, which is positioned below him and sways to the beat of the music a bit, kind of inviting viewers in, into the scene with the lyrics, come on, playing in an upbeat dance tempo. The video then cuts to show the two young men on the side of a large swimming pool um, and a, t you know, a, a teenage looking girl that he's picking up and twisting around, where's, a, where's an image of that, um, while the other, um, male involved holds the torch. It looks like quite a threatening scene when we pose it like that, doesn't it? Um, so uh, the teen young woman is dressed in a long skirt. We can't really see her. We can't see much of what's going on there. Uh, but the other and looks, you know, to be sort of struggling and suggestive that he's going to pick her up and throw her in the pool. Um, but what then happens is we don't see her being thrown into the pool. We see them both jumping into the pool together, um, which is clear if you have a still from there. Let's see. They do jump into the pool together, but it took me quite a few watches to figure out that that's what was actually happening. Um, so we'd suggest that while the threat of the young woman being physically overpowered by Kareem is hinted at here, especially in the fastness of the cuts and the lack of clarity in the action. In the end, it's then importantly signalled as her choice to jump into the pool with him fully clothed. Um, and in sum, what do I think is happening here? Well, I think a sense of risk for the woman is particularly being constructed in this scene um, and ultimately neutralised and disavowed depicted with two young men in a break in scene and uh, her date is shown as kind of physically overpowering her while the friend stands by and watches and then they're depicted jumping into the pool together. In both of these two ads, along with several others that, that we looked at, we'd suggest that danger, risk and fun and rebelliousness are alluded to here in racialized, sexed and class ways, while the US ad depicts a kind of post-feminist permissible rebelliousness with the, the white people in the scene and the young white woman leading an older looking man over the fence, the French ad gestures more explicitly towards danger for um, the young woman, we'd suggest to a reliance on kind of racialized stereotypes in the construction of Kareem and his private pool party. We suggest that the ads which depict trespassing into private property on Tinder dates in particular align with the kind of post-feminist sexual contract that McRobbie suggests is on offer to young women and Lee suggests is part of the Tinder cool girl idea whereby women are invited to participate in casual sex and asked to withhold complaint or critique of patriarchal and phallocentric heterosexual norms. And then here also kind of being invited, we think, to position, to reposition the subtly hinted at risk of heterosexual dating violence as ultimately kind of non-issue and part of the fun. Uh, so feminism is disarticulated in this campaign, we suggest, through the positioning of both singlehood and casual sex for women as widely destigmatized and then positioning the safe and the positioning of safety and violence as kind of diffuse non-issues in the global northern context. Um, now, is it gonna I'll just stay on here, hey? So if is it still sharing my screen, Linda? I've gone way over time. This is my last slide. That one? No, that one. Yeah. We go, ah, oh, whatever. Um, yeah, I'm 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, um, yeah, which is quite different to the, extra, you know, the very central focus on women's safety and control via the use of dating apps in the Tinder India um, YouTube site. So to very briefly summarise the points that we're trying to make in our paper, what we're interested in is how certain ideas certain kinds of feminist ideas are used and taken up here and celebrated in different ways in order to market casual sex for women. The complexities, ambiguities and contradictions of the transnational post-feminist media landscape that show up through this material, where in the Western context, as I said, a kind of a sense of risk of violence um, is gestured to in heteronormative dating, we'd suggest, only to be ultimately disavowed and reframed as exciting. While well, in the Indian market, Tinder must emphasise an explicit alignment with certain Western liberal feminist discourses around sexual consent and gender roles and women's safety and control via their use of this app. Um, in brief, what we suggest overall here is a kind of flattening out happening in this material and symbolic equation of heteronormative casual sex and dating with the upheaval of patriarchal social structures of intimate life. And through this kind of flattening out and symbolic equation, these more radical feminist aims are also disavowed. Thank you. Two questions. Um, I, I think let's just keep going because I went way over time. How about that? And I'll pass over to, I might need you to come and help again, Linda, while we pass over to Kia Hawker who I'll just read Kia's biography while you get us set up. So Kia is a third year PhD student from the University of Queensland and their research explores the way augmented reality is shifting our cultural and social political landscapes. Specifically, they frame AR as a frontier of future tech and therefore a viable blueprint to understanding how the simulated self may emerge and impact how we identify ourselves in a meta-like environment. So that's what we're about to hear from Kia in a moment. Sorry, Kia. Are you still on mute now, Kia? You can come off mute. Okay. Yep. We can Hello. <laughs> here so you can share your screen or say hello or yep here we go there we are fantastic thank you from the big screen <laughs> let me just get rid of that oh gosh okay great thank you so much for having me um i will share The wrong one, of course. All righty, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Cool. All righty, so thank you for that introduction, Amy. Um, I remember you giving that um, presentation at CSAA, and I still think about that video like every day, and I don't know what it is, but there's something about that video that just like really makes me feel strange in the stomach. So it was, it was interesting to see it again. Um, so I would just like to start by acknowledging the people's land that I'm on here in Brisbane, the Yagara and Turrbal people, uh, sovereignty was never ceded. So um, today I'm going to be speaking about one of my chapters that I've been developing for my thesis. And it's particularly interested in augmented reality and gender, because there's lots of interesting things going on there. and. This is just a sliver of my research, but um, yeah, hopefully you find it exciting. So um, 
The first thing I like to do, uh, and I'm finding I'm, I'm actually doing it less now, which is nice, but I, I like to define what I mean, what I say, augmented reality. So, you know, here's a quite techie definition, and it's just that it produces 3D computer generated simulations, which overlay and enhance real world environments. So the main thing to sort of take away from this is that I'm not talking about virtual reality uh, because, you know, it's virtual reality completely like situates the body within the practice. And we're finding that, you know, virtual reality is just not as accessible. Um, people aren't using it as much yet, um, but whereas augmented reality, it's on everyone's phone. So this is where we're really seeing this merging between the digital and the self happening in really, really interesting ways. So that's why. Um, it's become the focus of my research in particular. Alrighty, so to specify that down even more so, I'm specifically talking about the beauty filter today. And, you know, I, I've sort of just come up with this way of defining the beauty filter as technically coded with materials that conform to heteronormative notions of the westernized beauty standard. So these filters are like technically coded with assets that um match these heteronormative norms like clearing a user's skin um adding makeup shifting the lighting uh and adding like feminine decorations as well so there's a few things that they do to do that um furthermore they also will sometimes and increasingly often actually change the shape of your face so it's not uncommon for these filters to bring your jawline in bring your nose in change the width of your head uh, things like that. And it's gotten so intense that I now can sort of like, because I have to practice and use these filters so much, I can actually like predict what it's going to do to my face. And it's been, it's been a little rough actually, like having to be the test subject for this. So, you know, it's, it's quite interesting that there are these conventions of what needs to happen on my face to, to, to fit these like strange norms. Um, so I'll explain why I'm showing you this photo of myself with a chicken on my head. Um, you know, this, this filter was taken off Snapchat and I just think it's quite interesting because it's obviously to some extent meant to be humorous, right? There's a chicken on my head. There's no real rhyme or reason for it. It's just there, but you know, I'm not wearing any makeup in this, in this photo and I have the regular amount of pimples, etc. So I just think it's quite interesting that it's such a default to have these norms coded into every type of filter, uh, no matter what it's doing. So even if it's humorous or you know, not meant to be taken too seriously. The filter will always, you know, have this default push to smooth out your skin. And, you know, this filter actually makes my nose a bit smaller and change the width of my head as well. Um, so I think it's just a fantastic example of this consistent desire to, to sort of have these norms in every single filter. And then the other example I have here, um, hopefully that's all loading fine for you guys, but there's this user who she she shows the trending filters in a video and you can't see it here, but on TikTok, um, this example is obviously from TikTok, it'll have all the filters that's been used in the one um, video. So they're going through and showing you what's the hottest trending filters right now and how does it look on me? And this is this person's like entire account, right? They've got millions of followers and this is all they do. They, they go through filters that are trending and show people what they look like and you know, I just think it really shows how like pivotal um, the beauty filter is to the everyday flows and like the social capital that's happening um, on these social media platforms and, you know, in particular, uh, TikTok. Alrighty, so, you know, I found that there was just no way of escaping the, um, you know, the gender divide that does pop up sometimes when using filters. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'm. I just refer to users as feminine presenting, mass presenting, or non-binary presenting, because, you know, that's sort of what you see when you are scrolling through TikTok. You don't always sort of know someone's pronouns or what they identify as. So I just think it's it's a more uh, insightful way of, of looking at it. Um, but, you know, what I found is that the preferred gender representation of a user does influence how they engage with and apply beauty filters. So. Beauty filters are, are sort of typically applied by feminine presenting and non-binary users, uh, whereas masculine presenting uh, users definitely do, do still apply them, but it's sort of harder to take them seriously with it. They sort of can get away with doing it in an ironic or subversive manner. So it's common for, you know, mass presenting users to wear a filter and put the towel on their head if they're pretending to be their mum for like a skit or something like that. 
Uh, and, you know, the reason for that is because the male body is like inherently more open to ironic appropriations, whereas the female body is sort of viewed between this heterosexy frame, uh, taking Amy's term there. Um, and, you know, what, the, what they mean by that is referring to imagery, iconography and decorations, which reinforce current notions of feminine gender performativity as sexualized. So it's it's sort of what I found in by talking to people back this up as well. It's quite difficult to actually. Um, is it all good? Sorry, Tia. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> it's hard to tell if anyone can <laughs> hear me properly. All good. I'm good. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Um, so yeah, the point I'm just making there is that it's it's very hard for these feminine presenting users to sort of wear these these beauty filters in an ironic or joking way they're always to some extent going to be perceived as like sexualized or you know femininely um you know doing something that suits their gender representation so for my research i uh interviewed uh 30 everyday users of social media and then also 10 users who uh, create AR filters. And from these interviews, we sort of had these two major arguments uh, emerge, which were incredibly gendered and quite interesting. Uh, and one is that beauty filters are harmful as they potentially could be leading to, you know, body dysmorphia and poor self-esteem for users. But this group of people, you know, overall, they thought that the filters were pretty fun and harmless and, you know, often quite convenient because sometimes, you know, when you're just, start chatting someone from bed, you, you want to look nice without having to get makeup on. So, so they saw the convenience in it, but did also see the harm, uh, particularly with the filters that are changing our facial structuring. And then we have this other group of people who sort of view beauty filters as harmful as they perpetuate inauthenticity and vanity within online spaces. Uh, and this was a, a sort of a position held mainly by the men that I interviewed. So they sort of would say things like, you know, it's inauthentic, like, we don't know who that person really is because they're covering up and, you know, there's, it's just vain and it's narcissistic. And they, they interestingly didn't actually say anything about like body positivity or self-esteem issues. They just thought the whole thing was a little sketchy, I suppose. Um, and there were definitely a few like non-binary people and women who agreed with that take as well, but it was overwhelmingly uh, the guys. Um, but I think it's just interesting for a couple of reasons. So both groups of people have these like very strong worries about these filters. They they both saw harm uh, when I talked about it. And, you know, I didn't bring that up. That just sort of naturally would come up. But I think it's interesting that one, one group of people is focusing on the actual like social harm of people feeling bad about their bodies and feeling bad about themselves. And they're quite specific about what type of filter that they're not happy with. Um, whereas we still see this like quite entrenched belief that these women are deceiving us and that they're wearing makeup because they're not natural. And it was interesting to see that argument still come out now as well. Uh, so these arguments were also supported by what we see on social media itself. So there's like consistent debates uh, emerging between, especially on TikTok, um, between like beauty filters and being authentic. And this especially comes from like the makeup communities as well. Um, so there's like this constant like question of like, is the filter changing my facial structuring or not? Like, and often users like just not sure about what's going on. But I have this example here because um, I think it's quite interesting that this person's wearing this beauty filter and they're saying, you know, when you find out this filter doesn't change your facial features, it just adds makeup. So I think that's really interesting. They're saying like, you know, it's actually not changing our facial features. It's just really good makeup. Uh, and then we sort of have this other side of the coin where we have this user who's saying, well, I've recreated this filter with just makeup. And for some reason that like makes it authentic or validates it as a thing that's okay to use. And I find this boundary just really, really interesting. Um, and then, you know, Instagram and Snapchat are quite open about whether their filters change facial structuring or not. Whereas TikTok's kind of like doing what they always do and just not really saying much about it. Uh, but I thought, you know, I'd test this. So I was like, let's find out if this filter is actually um, changing my facial structuring. And I um, I got on TikTok and I recorded myself very quickly taking this specific filter on and off, like quite rapidly. And this is what, you know, I hope this works properly. Um, it's a bit rough for my self-esteem. <laughs> it's like, you know, I to me, it's quite clearly changing my facial structuring. So if you especially look like 
near the temple. Uh, it's bringing in my temple. And then it's also just really slightly bringing in my nose as well. And then of course my, my, my cheeks. And this is what these filters always do to my face, which is so interesting. Um, so, you know, to, to me, it's quite obvious that it is changing my facial, my facial structuring. And I just thought, what's this other user talking about then? You know, why would they be saying, okay, when you realize it's not changing anything, it's just makeup. And, you know, I have a few sort of theories and one of them is just that that maybe they're lying. Like maybe they're just doing this for clout to show off like that, that it's not like they, they, they could know knowingly be deceiving their audience uh, or they just don't notice it, which is, you know, even more interesting. Like it's so subtle that they're like, no, it's not changing my facial structuring. This is just what I look like. Um, and then I did have someone say, you know, what if their face already matched <laughs> the norms? Like what if they had the perfect face and the filter didn't change anything? And I just thought, yeah, well, maybe. Um, I haven't seen that before, but I'm sure it's definitely possible. But we see this all the time with beauty filters. It, you know, the one that comes to mind is this one on TikTok that would make you bald. And, you know, it's making you bald, but it was also adding makeup and like contouring your face and bringing your cheeks in. And all these people were posting saying, wow, like I would look so hot bald. Like maybe this is the ticket and maybe I should shave my head off. Um, but they just didn't realize that it was you know, it doesn't come with the nose job and all these other things. So uh, it's, I think it's quite interesting when the filter is able to sort of dictate behavior and physical looks just because it's subtly making you look more conventionally attractive. So I sort of, you know, I turned towards selfie literature to make sense of what's going on here because, you know, the selfie has been framed, uh, you know, as a creative, empowering, expressive tool used in one's ever evolving project of the self. Uh, and this framing was really essential at the time because they had to counter this conceptualization that selfies are just these acts of vanity and narcissism, you know, this media moral panic that these young women are taking selfies and all they care about is what they look like. And it's terrible that they're doing this. Um, but I sort of think now that maybe we can reintroduce the idea that there is a frivolous and fun and dare say it vain nature to, to taking selfies. Um, and you know, I think that they definitely still carry significant social and political power and, you know, they question the boundaries of agency here and self-empowerment, but I don't know. So my, my sort of question is if the two can sort of exist at the same time now because of the beauty filter and because of how the selfie has evolved. So then we, we, we sort of need to question, how does the beauty filter influence the selfie? So what exactly am I saying here? Um, and my point is that the beauty filter is just becoming increasingly realistic and immersive. When I first started my project, you know, all I had was Snapchat. TikTok wasn't even a thing here in Australia yet. And, you know, since TikTok, the filters have just become so polished and so, so good at, you know, putting it on your face. You don't even notice. Um, but I did have one informant who said that they think they were quite confident. They think that the beauty filter is going to eradicate the, the beauty standard because now you know, it evens the playing field. You don't have to do the makeup. You don't have to get the surgery. You can just put on this filter uh, and you look exactly like you want to look. And there are, of course, some really clear limitations to this. And one is race. Um, these filters will sometimes not work on people of color. Um, and then also, you know, class. So some people can't afford the latest phone and therefore they don't have access to the best technologies. Um, but, you know, that's a discussion for another day. I still thought it was quite an interesting point. And you know, why I think that the beauty filter is significantly influencing our understandings of the selfie is because more and more non-binary and masculine presenting users are using the filter and it's working. It's convincing you that it's not ironic. It's not a joke. Um, so this example, it's my left, might be your right, person with like the bushy hair. They said, okay, so they updated this filter in Australia and I get it now. And this was like a really popular filter and this uses actually the top video. So all the comments are like, oh, it looks so good on you. Like, I wish it looked like that on me. Um, and then this other one on the right is just some random person that popped up and they're saying, you know, trying the jelly filter for the first time. And I just think it's interesting because, you know, people aren't bullying them for this. This isn't like their whole identity. It's just like a casual thing they put up because they like the way it makes them look. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe question if through the beauty filter, like that, that we're sort of closing down these boundaries of, you know, it's just women doing it. So if the men are doing it too, we can understand that it's popping up in playful and frivolous ways. And it's a great way to explore what you look like and, and test like the boundaries of, of, you know, your gender and what makeup you use and things like this.
so, you know, I completely agree that, that selfies, of course, are much more than just like these frivolous self-absorbed acts. However, I think that they can sort of coexist. The, the, the vain aspect of the selfie is a significant part of the self-expression. You know, the two can't be separated. Um, and I sort of think that the inclusion of masculine presenting users, you know, it sort of has dismisses these original moral panics because if the guys are doing it, then we might take it seriously, you know. Um, and my, my next chapter is going to be all about check, like gender representations, what filters that add a beard and filters that make you femme looking and how this is, you know, there's been cases where people have tried it on in a silly way, but then they've realized, oh, I actually really prefer the way I look masked presenting. So I think it just opens up these really exciting opportunities. Um, and the fact that they are playful and frivolous means that you're not going to get teased for trying it out. You can just stumble across it one day and it, it opens up this beautiful you know, opportunity to explore parts of your identity that maybe you've never had the chance to do so before. Um, and also it's not permanent. <laughs> you can just pop it on and pop it off as well. Um, but yeah, my, my final point is just that, you know, this is one example of, of what I'm talking about here of how the filter shifts your gender representation online. And I'm thinking, you know, this is just going to intensify as the filters get more realistic and immersive. So I just think it's exciting uh, time for this right now. Uh, thank you.